You're listening to Nutrition Matters Podcast with Paige Smathers, Registered Dietitian Nutritionist. Hi everyone, it's Paige Smathers. Thanks so much for being here. Nutrition Matters Podcast explores what really matters in nutrition and health with a sensitive and realistic approach. To help support the podcast, please consider making a donation at positive-nutrition.com slash podcast. If you find this episode interesting, engaging, or helpful in your life, please consider donating, sharing with friends and family, and leaving a review on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, whatever podcast app you use to listen to this podcast. You can leave a review about this podcast straight from your podcast app, search Nutrition Matters Podcast, click reviews, and then write a review. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook if you'd like to have a little more food for thought. Thank you for listening. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Nutrition Matters Podcast. My name is Paige, and as always, I'm so excited to connect with you. Um, I'm recording this episode again, uh, just like the one before it. I'm recording this solo, and what I'm doing is I put out the word to my my Instagram followers to see if you had specific questions about intuitive eating, and I was going to try to answer them in last week's podcast, but actually got so many questions that I thought I might just need to do a part two to answer them. So here I am doing that. Um, And before we get into that, let me just take a few minutes to address some questions I've gotten kind of outside of the topic for today. So many of you will have already heard that I am planning on taking a two-month break from podcasting starting in November. So the month of November and December of 2018, I am just going to take a break and kind of um, gather my thoughts about the podcast and about, um, you know, how to move forward. So I've already mentioned this, but just in case this is the first time you're hearing this, I am just, I love to podcast. There are so many incredible things I get out of it. Um, I really, really love the work I get to do. Um, unfortunately it does take a lot of time and I don't really get paid to podcast and it's, it's exhausting emotionally and mentally. There's a lot that comes with putting stuff out there into the world. So, um, a lot of you have reached out very kindly and let me know that the podcast means a lot to you and, um, just nice messages. I've, I've been getting them regularly over the last few weeks, and I really appreciate that so much. Some of you have also mentioned, like, w- um, kind of asking, like, what would make it so that you do for sure want to come back to podcasting, or what would make it so that you don't feel like you need to take a break? And honestly, my answer is if I could make money podcasting, if I could feel like it was, um, you know, part of how I make an income, I'm, it might be easier for me to do this. <laughs> it's always easier to put yourself out there when you feel like you're getting paid. Um, I really do, it in my heart of hearts, I do this because I want to be um, a source of, of reason and a source of kind of goodness and positivity out into the world. And so that's my motivation for podcasting. Um, but yeah, it would be nice to get paid. So that's that's it's hard to ask for donations for something that people can get just for free. And over the years, I have gotten little donations of like 10 or $5 here and there, you know, a couple times a year. And that's always really nice. And it helps me cover the cost of the, of the podcast. And I've, and I also put that in a separate account to pay for continuing education. Um, but, but I have been approached multiple times by people wanting to sponsor the podcast and, and, um, to take advertisements. And I want to just tell all of you why I haven't done that. To me, and this is not a judgment on anyone else who podcasts or takes, you know, takes advertisement, but to me, it literally feels like selling my soul to the devil because the way advertising works is the more podcast downloads you get, then the more you get paid. So right now, I don't really think about, hmm, what's going to get me the most downloads and therefore what should I podcast about? I think, man, what are people struggling with and what could be helpful for people? And I feel like if I change my model to how can I get the most downloads and therefore I start um, podcasting that way and finding guests that way, I just feel like that's a recipe for me not being my authentic self and therefore that kind of potentially um, causing some issues for me just internally and in my heart. Like I just don't, I personally just don't feel right about that. So I have turned down sponsorship opportunities because of that. Um, just sort of 
recognizing like, okay, this podcasting thing I do doesn't really make me money, but um, it's worth it. And and I'm at this crossroads right now where I'm kind of like, is it worth it? Um, this isn't a plea to have everybody um, donate to the podcast, but but if I'm just being honest, you know, if I did get m- make money from the podcast, it would be a lot easier to keep doing it. Um, it's kind of weird to think like if everybody who listens to my podcast just donated like a dollar a year, um, or even like, um, I mean, obviously it would be more for this, but if someone, if everybody who listened donated a dollar per episode, um, I wouldn't have to work. (laughs) I mean, I wouldn't, I could retire soon. So it's just a really, it's an interesting thing. And I recognize I'm putting this out there for free and I'm doing that because I want to. Um, but I also think that as we're approaching this new kind of era in in our kind of world history, I think it's really fascinating to think about all the stuff we get for free and um, kind of thinking about how like at some point we are going to have to start, we pay for things one way or another is what I'm trying to say. Like when I think about Facebook or when I think about Instagram, like yes, those things are free to use, but but we pay for it with um, you know, sneaky ads and, and all kinds of like weird behind the scenes stuff that now we're just learning about. And I, there's a lot of people having conversations about how all of us are going to have to kind of recognize what we value and what information or what resources, um, we value and have been important to us. And we're going to have to kind of start donating to those in order to keep them going. So, um, you know, I've taken that challenge from other podcasts that I listen to that I just get so much from. And I have I have donated to people who are putting out great content for free. Um, I know it's it's hard and not everybody's able to or or willing or in a place where where it makes sense for them. And um I get that. But um even just like sharing the podcast and so that more people can find it or leaving reviews, all of that is super helpful. So this is just a long way of just kind of being honest and just letting you know where I am. I really don't know what the two months will will say and will tell me. You know, like I don't know what time will tell is what I'm trying to say about the two months that I'm going to take off. And I'm looking forward to kind of kind of refocusing and taking some of the pressure off myself to like always put this stuff out there. And then I'm just open to see kind of what feels right. So um, thanks so much for all of your support. That really means the world to me. Um, Another thing I want to mention is I have um, the Nutrition Matters podcast community on Facebook that you're always welcome to kind of check that out and request to join. We have some great people there, a couple hundred now, and um, it's a supportive space to kind of ask questions or or discuss topics with other people who are on a similar journey. As many of you know, I have released a new online course that I'm super excited about, and um, I it's it's called Positive Nutrition 101, and this course is all about how to kind of read the scientific literature, how to navigate nutrition noise, how to really feel grounded and secure in your nutrition knowledge, your nutrition science knowledge. So we talk about gut health, we talk about macronutrients, micronutrients, we talk about supplementation, we talk about um, reading the scientific literature, meal planning, grocery shopping, what is normal eating, we talk about exercise, um, lots of really important and interesting topics within the world of nutrition and nutrition science. So if you've kind of wanted a resource to learn more about nutrition, but kind of weren't interested in all the gimmicky um, stuff that often uh, comes with nutrition info, um, check it out. You might enjoy the enjoy the course. So that you can find that at positive-nutrition.com and then just click on the Academy tab and it'll take you right there. So you can check that out. And um, I think that's about all I wanted to say. Thank you so much to everybody who is so supportive and, um, and reaches out to me on a regular basis. It's amazing and awesome. And I really, I, I love this work that I get to do. Okay, so with all of that, let's get into the topic at hand. So I mentioned in the beginning that I reached out to my followers on Instagram and said, hey, what are your questions about intuitive eating? And I got so many questions that I needed to do a part two. 
So I'm going to kind of work through many of those questions here, and hopefully this feels helpful as sort of a part two to the foundation we laid last week in episode 134 about what is intuitive eating. Okay. So someone says, what do you do when you are trying to follow intuitive eating but can't stop binge eating? Okay. So, um... I don't, I'm, and again, I'm just going to kind of lay a disclaimer here. This is not medical advice. This is not replacing individual nutrition therapy. And this is also, um, you know, I recognize that the questions people ask are often, in order for me to really answer them, I have to ask a lot more questions about what that person is going through, what they're experiencing. So I'll do the best I can with limited information to provide some ideas and tips. So with this question, um, I, I really want to just say that intuitive eating is um, kind of appears one way on social media and then it's another when you actually sit down and read the book. So I re- I refer and recommend um, everybody read the book Intuitive Eating. And some, for some people, it's a hard read. It challenges a lot of things for people. Uh, but it, the questions about intuitive eating I get are often, it makes me wonder if you, if if you have a good understanding of intuitive eating or if you're just kind of on social media and just taking little like glimpses that people put out there in their social media and kind of assuming that you understand the concept. So that's not at all a knock to the person who asked this question. That's just something I wanted to say right up front. Like let's let's make sure we've read the book um, because I think sometimes that will help to answer a lot of these questions. So first of all, intuitive eating is a total practice. You are not just going to wake up one day and just be like, boom, all my behaviors that feel problematic are just magically uh, not here anymore. So binge eating is, you know, most of the time a result of restriction. So if you feel like you are really working on intuitive eating and trying to not restrict anymore, but you're still finding yourself binging, there's a good chance that there still is some restriction going on. So whether that's actual physical restriction where you're saying, I can't eat this, I can't eat that, that's one thing. But it also could be a mental restriction where you're still really caught up in dieting rules. You're still really saying, man, if I eat that, I'm a bad person. Or like, this food is totally bad for me. I shouldn't be doing this. And then you eat it. So take a look at that. Get really honest. Am I still sort of having a restrictive mindset or even restrictive eating patterns? Are you eating adequately throughout your day? Are you eating a nice solid breakfast, a nice solid lunch, and a good decent sized dinner with with snacks in between? If you aren't doing that, that is a really good place to start, kind of like I talked about in last week's episode. So if you are still just like, man, I've read the book, I feel like I have a good understanding of intuitive eating, but I am still stuck in this binging stuff, um, I would definitely recommend that you reach out for individual help because there's probably more stuff to explore. Okay, next question. Someone asked, "Is are there any tips for teaching preteens? My daughter is almost 11 and I could use some help. Okay, so... Um, again, this is always so tough, and I'm I'm not a very I'm not great at being brief. But um, having regular, reliable meals for yourself and for your children is a really good place to start. Um, helping them check in with their bodies, but not like overemphasizing that where it's like, "What does your stomach say? What do your stomach say?" Um, that might be a bit too much pressure. Uh, having family meals whenever possible, getting getting eating together and enjoying a wide variety of foods together, um, setting that example for your child that you enjoy all kinds of food. You have a neutral relationship with food where it's not, you know, you're not talking bad about your body or about food. You're kind of just enjoying it and moving on with your life. So I would look at how you're doing, how they're doing, um, if the problem is you're noticing they're, they're, they're having restrictive behaviors and you're concerned about that, definitely reach out for help. If you're noticing that they're having binging behaviors or if they're hoarding food or hiding food, there might be more stuff um, going on underneath the surface. So as far as teens, I think the big thing that gets in the way is lots of body image stuff, lots of comparing with friends, lots of diet talk at school, and 
doing your best to have open conversations about what's going on for them in those ways and seeing what you can do to kind of mitigate that or talk them through or ask questions or even reach out for help with, with a professional if needed. Okay, someone else asked, how does one shift focus from wanting to lose weight and then navigating weight gain? Okay, so how do you shift the focus from, uh, you know, eating or dieting for weight loss to eating for well-being? You know what? I actually have a podcast episode about this that I think would be really helpful. Obviously, I spend, um, you know, an, an entire hour talking about these topics in these episodes. So I'll refer you to that one for this particular question. But what I'll say just kind of right up front is this is a complete and total practice. And we use the word practice on purpose because it's supposed to help us recognize that, you know, this is challenging. This isn't going to just like happen, you know, one day. So practicing um, kind of reframing thoughts and like refocusing your efforts from weight loss to how you feel, to nourishing yourself, to taking good care of yourself and, you know, being able to live out the life that you want to live. Um, you know, ultimately that's really what the purpose of food is, is to help, you know, support you and your values and living your life instead of the other way around. So this podcast episode that I'm referring to here is one that I did with Rebecca Scritchfield, um, kind of a long time ago at this point. So Rebecca Scritchfield is the author of a book called um, Body Kindness, and we talked about shifting our focus from weight loss to well-being. So this is episode, let me see if I can find the number here for you. Uh, this it was episode, okay, 58. So this one's called Body Kindness Matters, Shifting the Focus of Health from Weight Loss to Well-Being. So check that one out. Um, check out her resources as well. Uh, she also has a podcast. Um, this is a lot of what I talk about in the podcast. So it's tough to just like distill it down into like, you know, two minutes in, in a quick little answer. This is a lot. This is an, a really big pursuit to kind of shift this focus from how do I lose weight or how do I eat the least amount possible to how do I care for myself? This requires a lot of rewiring of the brain of your brain. This requires a lot of kind of gentleness and compassion and self-talk work. This might even require therapy um, or, or nutrition therapy. So be gentle with yourself in the process. Okay, next question that I wanted to talk about was, what do you do if you're kind of a chubby foodie and your intuition tells you to eat it all? <laughs> um, I, I, I like that question because I, I can tell that it comes from a place of like just playfulness and it's not like, I'm hoping it's not putting yourself down. Um, you know, I, I would have to know more about what you actually mean by eat it all. Do you mean like eat tons and tons and tons of food or like eat all different types of foods? Um, would the way that you're eating, I guess what I would say is, I would want you to reflect on this. Would, is the way that you're eating um, concerning you just because it's concerning you or is it because of your weight? So that's a, that's a big question to ask yourself. Like if weight wasn't a thing, would I feel good about my eating? Would I feel positive about it? Would I feel like I'm doing a good job with it? Or is or not. And if the answer is, oh no, I would feel really good about my eating if it weren't for my weight, then I just say, you know what, let go of of that. Because that's not fair to judge yourself and your eating based on your weight. Whereas if your weight were different, then you wouldn't care about this. So I think that that's, that's how I would answer that. Um, reflect on that and see, see if there's something to that for you. Okay, how do you eat intuitively when you have type 1 diabetes? So um, again, intuitive eating on social media makes it sound like, you know, donuts and ice cream and cupcakes all day long, all the time, no rules, nothing at all, no structure, no balance. And um, I, I'm not dogging that because on the one hand, it's really important for those foods to be represented and it's important for people to see like, it's okay to eat a gosh dang cupcake, right? So I get why people do that, and I get why that's out there. But at the same time, I feel like it sometimes confuses people. So recognizing that intuitive eating, um, 
needs to work within your life. And I've said this so many times, like intuitive eating isn't the goal. Eat, living the life you want to live is the goal. So intuitive eating is the framework and you use the framework to then make it work for you with what you have going on. So for instance, I um, I don't have a chronic health condition, but I, I do have certain preferences and certain ways that I know my brain works well. Um, you know, I don't do great if I eat six times a day. I don't feel good when I eat really super duper often. I feel better with larger meals and maybe a snack or two throughout the day rather than, you know, little grazing, nibbling meals throughout the day. Now, someone who is like, you know, different interpretations of intuitive eating, some people will say, just eat whenever you're hungry and stop whenever you're full. For me, that doesn't work with what what makes me feel my best, but it also doesn't really work with um, what works with my schedule because I can't just say in the middle of teaching a class, I can't just say, oh, I'm getting a hunger cue. I got to pause right now and eat. You know, like we we have our lives we have to live. And so if part of what you're working with is a chronic health condition um, or a food allergy or type 1 diabetes, like you've got to just figure out a way to make intuitive eating work for you with what you're working with. So, um, yeah, you can't, you can't just like go and eat um, certain things like someone who doesn't have type 1 diabetes you know, can, you know, like you're going to have different things that you're working with. But there is some complexity and some nuance to explore with like, okay, is it just because I'm a type 1 diabetic, that doesn't mean I can't eat this food. It means I can, but I need to kind of, you know, think about some other things in order to make sure that that's going to work for me rather than against me. So making peace with food is is one of the principles of intuitive eating, rejecting the dieting mentality, challenging the food police, um, respecting your body, body, honoring your cues of hunger and fullness. Those are some of the main principles of intuitive eating. None of that is contraindicated in someone with type 1 diabetes. I think this question is getting at, well, you can't just eat whatever you want whenever with type 1 diabetes. Um, and definitely there's nuance there, but at the same time, I see where that's coming from, but that's only one little part of intuitive eating. So that's one thing that I would say about that. Okay, so someone else said, where to begin? I'm not sure how to trust my body, and it's scary and overwhelming. Okay, um, where to begin? I think so often we put this pressure on ourselves to make everything about like behaviors, behaviors, behaviors. I want to see things change right away. I want to, you know, notice a result, quote unquote. Um, but I think what I've observed in my clients over the years is a lot of times what we see first is we see a mindset shift. We see, um, you know, things starting to change in terms of how you talk to yourself in your own head or in terms of your, your ability to be compassionate um, or in terms of your ability to challenge diet culture in all of its different forms. So if you're kind of like, whoa, it feels scary to like start eating donuts, you know, um, okay, let's work with what sounds doable to you. Can you work on challenging dieting mentality? Can you work on making peace with food in your, at least mentally? Can you work on being kinder to yourself? Can you work on body image stuff? Um, now, if it's just super overwhelming and you really have nowhere, no idea of where to start and you just need some help, like that's also, you know, why I have a job. So, um, you know, consider reaching out to someone like me who might be able to help you really um, navigate your feelings and also navigate, you know, a good solid place to start because I, I can totally empathize with why that might feel completely overwhelming. Okay, your body's set point. Are there signs that you've reached it? Okay, here's what I want to say about that. The signs that you've reached your set point is when you feel consistent and um, reasonable around food and um, compassionate toward yourself, you feel like you're doing a good job self-care wise where you're in a groove, you're in general eating, you know, when you're hungry and able to do a good job of stopping when you're full, um, obviously with imperfections here and there, but like in general, you're in a good groove. You're moving your body in ways that feel joyful and positive for you. You're getting adequate rest. 
you're drinking enough water, you're engaging in the life that you want to live, and your body is staying the same weight, that is a good sign that that's probably the weight that your body wants to be. So that would be my response to that. Okay, how do you raise intuitive eaters? So that is another one that I will just refer you to some podcast episodes um, that I have recorded about that exact topic. So the first one is, let's see, what episode number is this? Sorry, I'm kind of looking through the archives right now. Okay, so episode 65 is Raising Intuitive Eaters, part one. I recorded this episode with Anna Lutz, and then we did a part two a couple weeks later, episode 74, Raising Intuitive Eaters, part two. So I will just refer you to that. Okay, here's another question. Once you are an intuitive eater, if your doctor says you have high blood pressure and need to cut sodium, what do you do? Okay. Um, I don't really want to necessarily like touch on specific, um, diagnoses and specific like nutrition interventions. Um, but, but what I'll say just sort of broadly and in general is when you're talking about, uh, like health conditions, um, you, we really can't underestimate the importance of considering our mental health as we consider our physical health. So if you are, um, Doctor's orders have have said, hey, you really need to change this, this, and this about your eating. Um, you know, I, I'm not necessarily wanting to say that's great advice or bad advice, but I, wanna, I want to empower you to be able to ask yourself, all right, I'm going to experiment with making this change. How does it feel to me? What is it? What consequences do I see this change bring in me? Am I able to do it and feel fine? Or do I do it and I feel all of a sudden now I am binging or now I am on this restrictive path or now I am having just never-ending obsessive thoughts about food and eating? Um, That intervention is likely not worth it if that's what it's creating in you. Or if you're feeling completely convinced this is the intervention you need to do, but you don't know how to do it without it causing all of these um, other issues, that's another time to reach out for support from someone like me. Okay. How do you politely shut down diet talk with friends and family as you begin your intuitive eating journey? Um, You know, that's a really great question. And that's another one that I get on a very regular basis. Just once you kind of learn about diet culture and can kind of see it for what it is and you challenge all this stuff for yourself but maybe you're still in a position where you're like not quite sure what your truth is and you're kind of feeling um, triggered by other people's conversations or maybe in other people's comments about you and your body or about them and their bodies and their eating it can be a really really tricky thing to navigate Um, and I don't think there's like any one easy answer that's like oh just say this and then that magically your problems go away but what I will say is I think things get better with time I think when you're new to this you feel this need to feel validated and to feel like people understand me and I like people get why I'm doing this and therefore like Or people don't get why I'm doing this and I need to tell them and I need to convert them to my ways. Um, But I think with time, you start to realize like, this is my truth. You're on your own journey and and we can be doing different things with our eating, but we can still love each other. We can disagree about ideas, but we still love each other, that kind of thing. So I'm not saying that's easy, but I am saying I think it gets better with time. So if you're new to this and it's feeling really frustrating, I just want to say I think it does get better as you kind of progress through time with this. I do have an entire podcast episode about this topic as well. So this is episode 99, Strategies for Navigating Diet Talk, um, where I talk with Hannah Turnbull, who's a registered dietitian, about this topic. So if you haven't checked that one out yet, go back and listen to that one. Okay, someone else asked, How do I get past the guilt that my body isn't telling me to eat fruits and veggies yet? Okay. Um, So that's another tough one without asking more questions. But what I want to just kind of throw out there is I personally don't think there's anything wrong with um, applying a sense of gentle nutrition to your eating, especially if you feel like you're um, in a good place enough with challenging diet culture and in kind of navigating your relationship with food. If you feel like you're in a pretty good place with that, um, but you're still kind of like, okay, where's the, 
where's the craving vegetables things coming from? I just want to say like, if, if you gently say, Hey, I'm going to add some veggies to this dinner right now. It doesn't sound amazing. I'm not dying to eat broccoli right now, but I happen to know that like getting a little fiber in my, in my dinners does help me go to the bathroom. It does help me feel better. It does help me, you know, whatever things function well. Um, I personally don't think there's anything wrong with that. So if if that is is something that you just don't intuitively feel like, mm, I want to eat broccoli, but you just say, mm, I'm going to eat some broccoli with this, but I'm also not going to feel guilty about enjoying these other elements of my dinner, um, that is fine. Uh, you have to take that at your pace. If you're not feeling ready for that, that's fine too. But I think part of this process is not only like healing your relationship with donuts and cheesecake and whatever else, but I think also part of this process is developing a healthy and positive relationship with things like vegetables or things like fruits or things that you used to eat when you were dieting. So to me, sometimes you just need to kind of expose yourself to that and be like, look, apples, like we've had a weird tumultuous past, but like we're going to be friends because I really do like you. And I like the way you make me feel when I when I eat you every once in a while. Um, so consider that. Consider exposing yourself to it and just really kind of being gentle with yourself, but also thinking about like it's just as important to develop a new relationship with vegetables as it is to develop a, a new relationship with cheesecake. Okay. Another question says, how does someone with a gastric sleeve transition to intuitive eating? That one I am going to just say, great question, but you should see a uh, registered dietitian to talk about the your particular situation and what's going on for you, your specific and personalized medical history, um, and just kind of navigating all that. That's one of those things. It's like, yep, go ahead and check in with someone who... Um, is credentialed and licensed and hopefully informed, intuitive eating informed. Okie doke. Next question, how to eliminate guilt from my life and food, my food choices? <laughs> awesome. I'm so glad you think I have the answer about <laughs> big life questions. I'm honored. <laughs> um, but yeah, in all seriousness, I think what's so cool about working on stuff with food is that it, you can't help but have these principles and skills and ways of thinking translate into other areas of life. So um, I think the question about life will come if you can work on it with food. In other words, if you work on letting go of guilt around food and getting better at treating yourself with compassion and um, all of that awesome stuff, you can't help but do better at letting go of guilt in life and being more compassionate to yourself in life. So any efforts you make at um, treating yourself with more kindness and um, yeah, being more gentle with yourself, that can't help but translate into life in general. So letting go of food guilt, I think, um, is a big question. I honestly recommend my course for that. So this Positive Nutrition 101 course where we're talking about the science of nutrition, like I think a lot of the guilt that we have is due to like misinformation and not really understanding the science because truly, truly like food isn't as scary as so many other things in life, but especially like not as scary as some of these food bloggers or social media influencers are trying to make it sound like food just isn't scary. It Food isn't a moral issue either. Um, you're not good or bad if you eat certain things. Just, I mean, that's just silly. So really, I think my best recommendation would be invest in that course. I think that will help you let go of a lot of food guilt. I know for me, the more I learned about nutrition and about science, the more I was able to recognize like, oh, all this guilt I have is like really misinformed and like actually doesn't really make sense. Okie doke. Another question. How can I introduce this to my children so it's a natural concept and so they know others may treat food differently but that they shouldn't judge? Again, I recommend those two episodes, um, Raising Intuitive Eaters Part 1 and 2. I think it was episode 65 and then 74. Okay. As an RD to be, meaning registered dietitian uh, to be, how can I introduce intuitive eating to newbies without sounding like eating without any rules? Okay, so um, 
I don't really feel like, okay, I don't really love labels. I struggle with labels. I think the minute we put words to stuff, we like, we risk being really, um, confused and misinterpreted and kind of misunderstood. So I actually shy away from saying like, I'm an intuitive eating dietitian or even like I'm a health at every size dietitian. I just, I don't like introduce myself that way. Know what I'm saying? So I think, you know, if someone, I I don't feel the need to like put that on someone else that I'm interacting with. I don't feel the need to be like, here's what I do and here's who I am and here's my labels and here's my identity. Like, let me tell you why it's so awesome. And I'm not necessarily saying you're doing that, but one of the things that I think is is kind of a powerful tactic here is to really just let people come to you. So if people come to you and they want to know, hey, what's your philosophy about nutrition? Or like, how do you interact with your clients? Or how do you see this particular issue? That's, that's an open invitation for you to say, you know what, here's what I have found works really well. Um, kind of making peace with food, being gentle with yourself, having a gentle sense of nutrition when it, when it's appropriate and when people are ready. I find that people take better care of themselves when they're not caught up in this dieting cycle. Um, so I'll keep it simple to something like that. But I can't tell you how many times I'm at, you know, family gatherings or social interactions or even professional things where, you know, people will say things like, oh my gosh, don't judge what I'm eating. And you know, I, I gently say, Oh, you know, I'm not the food police. It's okay. But I don't really necessarily feel like I need to be like, Oh, and let me tell you every single thing I know about intuitive eating. I just kind of let them, let them come to me if they want to. That's my style. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but I think if a newbie wants to learn, they're going to be more receptive than if a newbie is feeling like you're saying, Hey, this is how we're supposed to do it. And this is the right way. Let me tell you, or let me change your mind. I just feel like that doesn't go over very well. So I just kind of don't, don't approach it that way. But in general saying like, you know, the, what I found through my experience is that, um, our minds and our bodies are so connected. And if we can work on treating ourselves with more kindness and approaching food in less of a charged way, we often find that we actually eat better and we actually take better care of ourselves. And it's more natural and intuitive to get a good balance and to feel reasonable around food. Um, I often also will say stuff like, Nutrition is one important part of health, but it's not everything. So as dietitians, we need to put nutrition into perspective for people. We need to let people value other areas of life and wellness that make them feel whole and well. And so intuitive eating to me is a really good framework to be able to support people in living full, happy, healthy lives rather than turning nutrition into like this thing that consumes them and turns them into a robot and doesn't let them actually live a full and reasonable and healthy life. Okay, are you guys sick of my voice yet? Oh my goodness. Okay. Another question. I have issues with binging and control. Do you use intuitive eating to help with this? Okay, so this is a good question, and I kind of hit on binging a little bit in, in um, you know, before. I don't want to get too specific here because it really depends on this individual's experience. But, you know, intuitive eating, I think, is so powerful in challenging lots of the causes and conditions that often lead to this behavior of binging. So, yes, like challenging diet culture, making peace with food, um, learning what your body is communicating to you in terms of uh, fullness and hunger cues, um, discovering satisfaction, um, challenging the food police. I think all of that can be so critical in working through um, binging. Okay. Um, An eating disorder and past chronic illness have left me with zero hunger ever. Is intuitive eating a possibility? Okay. So, Intuitive eating is not the hunger and fullness diet. So if you don't have great hunger cues or great fullness cues right now, you can still do work on so many other things. You can work on, you know, so many of the principles that I talked last week. So if you haven't listened to the episode from last week, check that one out. So I don't think that there is anything wrong with, you know, tuning into your body and saying, wow, how interesting. I really don't have hunger cues. All right, well, I still know that I need to eat. And a good thing to maybe start off with is three meals and, you know, 
two to three snacks or so in a day. And maybe you just start with this consistency or you just maybe not start, but continue with feeding yourself consistently. But in the meantime, you're working on um, the other elements of intuitive eating that can have such powerful implications. So again, intuitive eating is meant to work for you. It's not meant to be this thing that you like try to like check off all these boxes and be perfect at. If you don't have, if certain like principles of intuitive eating just don't like resonate with you, especially like if you're new to it and you're just like trying to wrap your head around it, you don't need to be perfect at all of them, you know? Just take the ones that feel doable to you given your circumstance. Okay. Okay, so another question is, how do I get others out of my head who have told me my worth is in what I look like? Um, practice, practice, practice. Boundaries. Uh, setting your life up in term that's most supportive of you being able to accomplish that incredible goal. Um curating your social media feed, getting rid of people who are making you feel bad about yourself or making you feel like your worth is tied up in the way you look. Unfollow. Go through your social media and unfollow those people. Start following people like Beauty Redefined, who does such an incredible job hitting on this idea of self-objectification and body image resilience. Um, I am so proud of the work that those two women do. I am so proud to be a part of this, um, of facilitating a, a local group in Salt Lake City for women who are working toward body image resilience. I'm on, this is um, week four right now of this group that I'm doing, and it has been fabulous. So um, for anyone listening who's local, if you want to get on the wait list for 2019, head on over to positive-nutrition.com slash group or just hover over the academy tab and click on body image resilience group. Scroll all the way down to the bottom and fill out the interest form. I will be running more of these groups. They have been fantastic. Like I can't say enough positive stuff about it. I'm just so excited about this work of, you know, separating our worth from our weight. I think that is so huge and so profound and such hard work, but the more people who do this work, the safer this world is for all of us to exist in it. So anyway, I just, it's a practice. And I think looking at your life critically and saying, how can I set boundaries? How can I unfollow? How can I curate social media, friends, family, work, um, life in general to support this goal of mine to separate these things? Um, th those are all really important parts of the equation. Okay. Someone else asked, why is it so hard? <laughs> um, it's so hard because you are literally changing, you know, such deeply held core beliefs, such important, important things that connect to like the most important parts of, of our humanity. Things like our sense of self-worth, things like our um, sense of identity or our place in this world or our ability to... Um, connect with others, our willingness or ability to connect um, in relationships. This is so hard because we are changing how we think about our worth, how we think about our place in this world, how we think about our identity. That doesn't just happen overnight. This is so, so hard. And so if you're in the middle of this and you're like, gosh, this is really challenging, um, I want you to know it gets better. But you have to think about this as a practice. You have to continually work on this stuff because it is super, super challenging. And you, your process of learning about this stuff and working on this stuff will look very much non-linear. You will have good days. You will have hard days. You will have days that just feel like you're on top of the world and days where you're just like, why am I doing this? Um, all of that's part of the process. You're not doing something wrong if it's hard. Um, you're doing something right. Okay, tips for creating mindfulness around the free-for-all stage in making peace with food. Um, that's a great question. Um, I think sometimes mindfulness kind of gets turned into like meaning, um, if I'm mindful, then I won't eat this, right? So it kind of, it can almost be like a sneaky dieting word. So I think just you know, the way I think of mindfulness is it's creating this gap in between stimulus and response where you are stepping back and you're saying, all right, what's going on here? 
how am I feeling? Um, gathering all of kind of all of the data at hand and you're able to just pause and say, okay, um, how do I feel? What do I feel like I want? Um, what might work to help give me the energy that I need for what I'm about to do? When do I plan on eating next? Um, creating just a little bit of a gap can be very helpful to kind of center yourself. Now, some people in certain phases or in certain conditions, they might need that mindful gap might actually get in the way of them nourishing themselves the way that they should. Sometimes overthinking it can then lead to like, nah, I guess I just won't. So be mindful of that. Like maybe your mindfulness is just going for it and just not thinking too much. Um, but then remembering that at some point, you know, you will be able to come back to like practicing this this mindfulness stuff but sometimes in the beginning you need to just kind of um, not let your thoughts get the best of you okay all right so I have oh my gosh I have even more questions my goodness so um, I have done the best that I can to kind of get through these questions my throat is feeling kind of dry <laughs> so um, I think that, that that feels good. Like I've, I've made a really good effort to kind of answer these questions and do the best I can with limited information. I want you to know like you're, you're doing awesome work by even just tuning into this podcast, like by being engaged in taking great care of yourself and in doing it in a way that's kind and compassionate and balanced and positive, like that's awesome work. And, um, Resist the urge to turn intuitive, intuitive eating into some brand new diet where now it's the hunger and fullness diet or it's the um, screw all the rules and flip the bird to diet culture and then just eat everything in sight. Like, I mean, maybe there's a time and a place for that, that anger and that kind of like doing the opposite thing, but just resist the urge to turn this into like do's and don'ts, shoulds and shouldn'ts, um, you know, checklists, things like that because you will um, miss out on the beauty of really, really digging into this stuff for real. So I hope that some of the thoughts that I've given out in this podcast episode have felt helpful. Again, like if you're in a place where the nutrition part of this feels tricky, or if you're just struggling to kind of figure out all that nutrition noise, maybe check out the online course. It might be a good fit for you. Um, to kind of have a good idea and understanding of the nutrition science and to be able to kind of confidently walk through the world, being able to navigate the fact versus fiction um, and or staying in your own truth about how you nourish yourself. Um, so with that, I just want to say thanks so much again for tuning in. It is such a pleasure and an honor to be a part of your lives, even a small part. Um, it means a lot to me and I'm grateful for each and every one of you. So thanks for being here and enjoy your week. I will be back next week with kind of the regular interview style and I will be podcasting through October. And thanks again for being here. Well, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed this conversation. If you haven't already, please go ahead and leave a review on iTunes. Thanks again so much for listening and we'll see you soon for another episode.